The Holodomor was not an intentional genocide, despite how much liberals try to equate communists and Nazis. The truth proves their horseshoe theory to be nonsense. Today I am talking about Holodomor and whether or not it was a man-made intentional genocide. To understand the Ukrainian famine from 1932 to 1933, we need to look at the socio-political and economic situation in the Russian Empire and the early Soviet Union. Before the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, the Russian Empire was mostly an agricultural society, with the large gap between the rich and the poor. Farming methods were outdated, and farmers struggled to produce enough food. This led to frequent famines caused by natural disasters, like droughts, floods and pests. These famines happened almost every 2-3 to three years in different parts of the empire. For example, famines occurred in 1901, 1906, 1911 and 1917. They affected various regions and caused a lot of suffering and loss of life. One of the worst famines happened from 1921 to 1923, during the early years of the Soviet Union, mainly because of the Russian Civil War. This famine was particularly devastating, and is considered one of the worst in Russian history. Understanding historical context of frequent famines and the social, political and economic difficulties of the Russian Empire and early Soviet Union helps us grasp the complex factors that contributed to the Ukrainian famine. It highlights the importance of considering technological limitations, natural disasters and the need for agricultural improvements when examining the causes of the famine. The Holodomor happened for several reasons, including technological limitations in farming, difficulties in transportation and communication, and natural disasters affecting crops. Let me explain. Farming methods in the Russian Empire and early Soviet Union were outdated and not very effective. Small-scale farming didn't produce enough food to meet the population's needs. The lack of modern tools and techniques, like advanced machinery and better farming practices, made it hard to grow enough crops. Experts like Robert Davies and Stephen G. Wheatcroft, who study agriculture, have shown that outdated farming practices needed to be improved through modernization and industrialization. Getting help to people affected by the famine was hard because the transportation and communication systems were not well developed. Bad roads made it difficult to deliver aid quickly. Also, there weren't good ways to share information and coordinate relief efforts. Historical records show that authorities struggled to respond to the famine due to these challenges. The Ukrainian region, like many agricultural areas, was prone to natural disasters that harmed crops. Droughts, floods and extreme weather damaged crops, leading to fewer harvests and less food. Even before the Soviet era, Ukraine faced famines regularly. This shows that the region was vulnerable to natural factors that disrupted farming and worsened the food shortage. Studies by experts like Mark Torger, who was knowledgeable about Soviet agriculture, emphasized the role of natural factors in the Ukrainian famine. Torga argues that these factors, combined with technological and infrastructure limitations, made the food crisis worse. It is no secret that the Kulaks played a part in making the famine even worse. The Kulaks made up about 10-11% to of the population, and in Ukraine, there were more Kulaks than in any other parts of the Soviet Union. During the years of the new economic policy, from 1920 to 1927, the Kulaks gained control of a lot of the village land. 
They were involved in speculative activities in the food market, which caused shortages by 1927. This means that there were less grain available for sale compared to before the war, even though more grain was being produced. When the NEP was introduced, which allowed for temporary free market, things did not go well. Nearly 3 million peasants lost their land because the Kulaks bankrupted them and bought their land cheaply. This made the Kulaks own a lot of land, horses and machines, and they produced more than half of the food that was sold. In 1927, the government started a policy to buy grain from farmers at set prices. The Kulaks didn't want to sell their grain at those prices because they wanted higher prices and fewer regulations. They wanted the government to give in to their demands, which would have meant going back to a system of capitalism. The Kulaks did illegal things like selling on the black market and keeping grain for themselves instead of selling it. This made the government take action and take away the illegally hoarded grain. In response, the Kulaks decided to produce as little grain as possible so that there would not be enough for the government to buy. This made the poor peasants angry and they started to take Kulak land and farm it themselves. The Kulaks reacted violently by killing communist organizers and collective farmers. The government then deported the Kulaks. To stop the poor from taking their property, the Kulaks started destroying their own belongings. This was a kind of terrorism that affected the food production. They deliberately destroyed machinery, food and livestock. This made the already tense situation in the countryside even worse. The poor peasants had been resentful of the Kulaks for a long time, and now they could finally do something about it. In response, the government decided to eliminate Kulaks as a class by taking away their wealth and their status. The Kulaks had most of the livestock and machinery, while most peasants had very little. Many peasants' households didn't even have a single horse. The destruction caused by the Kulaks, especially the shortages of horses for plowing, made the famine even worse. The use of photographs to depict the Ukrainian famine has been a prominent tool in promoting the concept of the Holodomor as a deliberate genocide. However, a critical examination of these photographs reveals a significant issue. Many of them were published by pro-Nazi sources or their supporters, such as the American Hess Press. The intention behind the circulation of these images was primarily shock value rather than a genuine representation of the causes or severity of the famine. It is important to note that the existence of starvation as captured in these photographs does not automatically validate the Holodomor theory. While the famine was undoubtedly a humanitarian disaster, using these images to evoke sympathy for the Holodomor theory does not make the theory any more true or accurate. What is particularly striking is the origin and misrepresentation of these photographs. Many of the pictures circulated as depictions of the Ukrainian famine are not actually taken in the context they claim to be. Instead, they have been taken from various historical periods, including World War I, the American Civil War, the Great Depression, and the Russian Civil War. Over time, this collection of fraudulent Holodomor photos has been supplemented with images from other conflicts such as the Siege of Leningrad and the Battle of Kharkov. D. Tuttle's book, Fraud, Famine and Fascism, offers a comprehensive study of the use of fake Holodomor photos by far-right sources. The book exposes the deliberate manipulation and misattribution of images by those seeking to propagate the narrative of intentional genocide during the Ukrainian famine. Tottle's research sheds light on the ulterior motives behind the use of these photographs and calls into question the credibility of their claims. The inclusion of such misleading and manipulated images in discussions about the Holodomor raises questions about the reliability of the evidence put forward to support the intentional genocide theory. 
relying on these photographs without critical scrutiny, undermines the objective understanding of historical events and perpetuates a distorted narrative. The anti-communist narrative suggests that during the famine, the Soviet government intentionally exported substantial amounts of grain while Ukraine suffered from starvation. However, a closer look at the export data reveals a different reality. In 1930, the Soviet government exported a significant quantity of grain, totaling 4,846,024 tonnes. The following year, the export figure increased to 5,182,835 tonnes. However, in 1932, the year when the famine began, the amount of grain exported significantly decreased to only 1,819,114 tonnes. Furthermore, during the first half of 1932, imports of 750,000 tonnes were recorded, with an additional 157,000 tonnes imported from late April onwards. The decrease in grain exports and the substantial imports during the famine period contradict the notion of intentional starvation and support a different narrative. The Soviet government, upon realising the extent of the famine, recognised the urgent need for food and aid in Ukraine. As a result, they not only reduced their grain exports, but also imported over a million tonnes, specifically intended as assistance for the affected region. These export and import figures effectively debunk the genocide theory, as they contradict the claim that the Soviet Union deliberately withheld grain from Ukraine to suppress nationalism. Professor Mark B. Talker, in his work, What Caused Famine in Ukraine, highlights that the official statistics clearly indicate that the procurements taken from 1932 harvests were actually less than the procurements in any other year during the 1930s. However, the question still arises. Why did the Soviet Union continue to export grain during the famine? To comprehend this, we must consider the USSR's need for capital to fuel its ambitious industrial projects and acquire necessary machinery from the West. Two primary sources were identified to meet this capital requirements. Selling valuable commodities such as oil, gold, minerals, agricultural goods like cotton and other products to the Western market, and selling consumer goods within the Soviet Union's internal market. Initially, the plan did not involve exporting such substantial quantities of food grain. Most of it was intended for the domestic market. However, the Soviet Union faced a significant obstacle when Western powers imposed a blockade on Soviet oil and the country's gold currency. It is crucial to understand that the Soviet government collected and exported grain not with the intent of intentionally starving a portion of the population, but rather because it was the only means to secure the necessary funds for equipment and supplies. Stalin's hopes rested on a successful harvest, which unfortunately proved to be meagre due to the drought. The USSR encountered difficulties in purchasing food with gold, owing to the gold blockade, or currency, as a result of the imposed embargo. Desperate attempts were made to procure grain from Persia, where it was agreed to accept gold. However, time was not on their side, as the catastrophe was already unfolding. Between 1932 and 33, thousands upon thousands of people tragically lost their lives due to this famine. It was only after this devastating period that the West eventually resumed accepting oil, timber and precious metals from the Soviets. If only they had done that a couple years earlier, maybe the famine wouldn't have been as bad. It is essential to recognise that the Soviet Union, as an agrarian nation, heavily relied on the sale of raw materials, including cotton, coal, oil and various agricultural crops, 
prior to its industrialization. Paradoxically, the only viable path out of this cycle of agrarian backwardness was through industrialization. However, the question of how to acquire the necessary funds to support industrialization remains. It would be unreasonable and detached from material reality to expect the Soviet Union to cease all exports during the 1932 to 1933 period. The challenges they face were compounded by the economic blockade and the poor harvest in the early 1930s. Circumstances beyond the Soviet government's control. One might argue as a last ditch effort, why not hold all industrialization and allocate all available food to the citizens? The answer becomes evident upon closer examination. Ceasing all industrial projects and diverting all possible resources to immediate food provision was an impractical solution. The Soviet Union had embarked on a comprehensive process of modernizing the country, and halting these projects would have been a monumental task. Furthermore, the purchase of machinery for industrialization had to be financed somehow, even if the overall project was temporarily postponed. It is worth noting that the Soviets did reduce their pace of industrialization and cut exports when the severity of the famine became apparent. Large-scale exports occurred prior to the onset of the famine, when there was no immediate danger. This crucial aspect is often overlooked by right-wing anti-communists, who erroneously attribute casualty to exports as the primary cause of the famine, despite the fact that exports were reduced and the government resorted to importing food when the famine struck. Moreover, halting industrialization would not have addressed Russia's underlying troubles. Famine was a persistent problem, not due to industrialization, but rather due to the lack thereof. Suspending the modernization efforts would have perpetuated the chronic food insecurity prevalent in the country. The most viable solution to the grain question, as the Soviets termed it, was to modernize the nation. But anyway, that's the end. I do want to read this quick bit before I finish off. The famine was not deliberate or man-made. It was caused by difficult weather conditions and the general backwardness left by Tsarism in the country. As there exists no evidence of deliberate genocide and the case relies entirely on the false assumption that the USSR kept exporting more and more food grain, completely disregarding the famine, I can confidently say that the Holodomor has been debunked as a myth and a fabrication. It is revealing to look at who the people spreading this myth are. In the 1930s, they were the Nazi press and their American collaborators. In the modern era, their work was carried out by Cold War anti-communists and far-right Ukrainian imageries. The myth is still widely propagated by those elements, together with Ukrainian neo-Nazis. The Holodomor myth is the work of Goebbels. Anyway, if you did enjoy this video and you appreciated all the research that went into it, please subscribe and hit like. And check out my video that I've made on Stalin last week. I think you'll find it interesting.